So I'm going to be speaking in the next uh, 15 or so minutes about uh, immune-related adverse events, but I'm starting with uh, pictures of me. In fact, in Nainital and in Hardiwar, this was a year and a half ago, seems like decades ago. I really like coming to India and I would love uh, to come uh, again to your uh, great uh, nation. And really what I would uh, like to do in the next, let's say, 18 minutes is to talk, to describe the pathophysiology of immune-mediated side effects of IO drugs, to describe the frequent toxicities, to describe, to uh, to outline the standard guidelines for management of the toxicities, to somewhat touch upon the more rare and urgent toxicities of treatment and, to, and their um, management, and then maybe share a little bit of my personal experience about how we do this in our uh, chemo uh, daycare. Now, Sawanti, do you think we should more focus on the, on the, on the common uh, side effects or the rare ones? Well, what would be more appropriate for the forum? I think... Uh, uh the rarer ones would uh, shedding light on the rarer ones briefly and then just addressing the common ones would be better. wonderful wonderful so this is what i'll do and of course i can leave the slides if anybody wants to uh, further uh, go into them so really talking about the pathophysiology of immune mediated side effects we know that the pd1 pd1 ligand pair is not uh, per se um was was not evolutionized to towards the generating um generating immune inhibition in cancer. Rather, it's an evolutionary mechanism that allows normal organs and tissues to induce immune tolerance towards them in the healthy host. And so inhibiting this interaction using anti-PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors can break the normal tolerance of immune cells to tissues and organs, thus eliciting a drug-induced inflammatory response, if you will. So if we want to inhibit this pair in the tissue and to, uh, to generate a desired activation of T cells, then this is in fact the same mechanism that allows uh, for the toxicity. So in general, we can divide the toxicities broadly into two non-immune mediated side effects that would include as always hypersensitivity to IV drugs, fever, chills, flu-like symptoms and fatigue. We all know how to manage these uh, reactions and I'm not going to be discussing them further. But then the immune mediated side effects can appear per definition in any tissue or organ in the body. And the important point is that they can uh, appear at any time point during treatment and also after the termination of treatment. I'm just now uh, managing a patient of mine who has finished his anti-PD-1 treatment for his head and neck cancer back in April, but then only now developed this hypothyroidism, which I actually missed at the beginning because I thought his fatigue was, was, was cancer-related rather to than to realize that he actually developed hypothyroidism four months and more after terminating his immune oncology uh, treatment. Now, of course, the most common organs involved, the skin, the colon, the lung, the endocrine glands, the kidney, and the liver, but we've seen it throughout all organs and system of the, of the body. And this is really a, a already a few years ago, optimal management of immune related toxicities. And I've highlighted a few points, of course, awareness. We must be aware, but our patients must also be aware for, of these drug, um, of this drug uh, toxicity, the patients, the families, because sometimes they would be the ones telling their, uh, their emergency room uh, physician, listen, but I am getting this thing and I was told that it can cause, you know, some sort of inflammation, etc. Uh, so patient education is key here. Uh, we must uh, recognize these uh, toxicities early to start treatment early. And really, I think what we've learned in the last five years is really not to hold upon treatment when when we're when we're suspecting this uh, toxicity early intervention we're grading them according we're grading the toxicities according to the ctcae of course i'm not sitting with the little books and giving the exact grades as in the clinical trials but i do want to know what's the extent of the toxicity because the whole um, point of the treatment is uh, according to toxicity in grade one we we will give supportive care if it's an antihistamine cream for a rash if it's loperamid for uh, colitis, but then of course, once it becomes uh, grade two or higher, we're talking about high grade, high dose, um, we are talking about high dose cortisol steroids. And of course, we know that if there is no such thing in immunotherapy as a dose reduction. So the decision we need to make upon termination of the toxicity is whether we want to resume immunotherapy or not, but not, there's no uh, thing as, as a dose reduction. So how do we diagnose these things? They're diagnosed clinically. So that means it's based on the characteristic constellation of symptoms and signs. And it's also many times a, 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 
uh, diagnosis of exclusion. So if we see an nephritis, we see acute renal failure, there's no obstruction to the kidneys, there's no nephrotoxic drug, then you may very well assume that this is the immune mediated nephritis and start treatment. And same would be for many uh, more of the toxicities. Um, now, of course, this is the basis of the whole, the whole protocol and the protocol itself is very straightforward. We start with regular, or if you want to call them high dose steroids, which is prednisone or prednisolone at one milligram per kilograms. Sometimes we move, if we don't see enough response, we move to high dose steroids, what some institutions call pulse, which would be at, at around two to four milligrams per, ki per kilogram of uh, methylprednisolone or the equivalent. And of course the protocols vary. And then if we don't um, generate resolution or if there's um, deterioration, then there is room for other immunosuppressants such as anti-TNF antibodies, cyclosporin, uh, Celsept, and, and, and so forth. So uh, a little more about the diagnosis. We should always, of course, rule out other causes for toxicity. And uh, sometimes we even use concomitant treatments against several potential diagnoses. For example, we all use uh, steroids and antibiotics when you're not sure if it's a pneumonitis and pneumonia. And my, many times it can indeed be both. All accompanying symptoms, signs, and abnormalities should, of course, be addressed and corrected. This is, this is our regular you know, med medicine, medicinal work, supportive treatment, never forget, you know, so give the PPIs if you give the steroids, give fluids as needed, pain medication, antihistamines, and etc. And we've also learned that steroid tapering should be long. Now, again, this is a little bit of an art. By now, I've, I've been doing this for a few years, so I know that there are some toxicities that need longer taper than the others, and then also it's a it's a it's a trial and trial and error thing. When I when I discuss tapering with my patients, I actually tell them when if you go down to the next level, say go from 40 prednisone to 20, and you have you have the toxicity resume, please go back on your own to the um, to the previous uh, dose of steroids, and of course let me know. So so really, it's a little bit of a fine tuning uh, thing. And as a general um, rule, we do not resume uh, immune oncology drugs uh, when the dose of, um, of prednisone is more than 10 milligrams per kilograms. I do, um, I do resume when the dose is 10 milligrams, uh, sorry, 10 milligrams, not 10 milligrams per kilogram. When the dose, when the flat dose is 10 milligrams, we do resume. And in fact, I will tell you this, we, and we have noticed that many patients, when they have a prolonged uh, treatment course with immune oncology, they actually need their 10 milligrams of prednisone. So many of these patients actually never stop. And this is something I've learned not to worry about at all. I don't think this 10 milligrams of prednisone uh, does not uh, negatively impact the efficacy of the immune oncology, nor in most cases does it cause significant toxicity. Of course, in diabetics and such, we need to worry, but most people uh, will need their 10 milligrams of prednisone for a sort of general, um, general um, management. And this is uh, this is one of the one of the guidelines uh, that that the that this this talk was taken from, and this is another one from JCO. And uh, I'll, I'll quickly run on a few of the toxicities. So um, skin toxicity. These are, of course, the most common side effects, and they can come in all shapes and forms of so pruritus and rash and dermatitis and all, all of what is here mentioned. And, and really, most of the events are really low grade, so really things that can be managed, but there are grade three to four events. They are very rare. The treatment starts with antihistamine, but then we can move on to topical steroids and then in some patients, we cannot uh, go without oral steroids, which is a little different uh, than the regular dermatology. So my dermatologists, many times they argue with me, they say, but we don't give a systemic uh, prednisone for rashes. And I say, yes, but this is something a little different. And sometimes we have to give systemic uh, prednisone uh, for these uh, types of rashes. And of course, um, uh, for grade three and four toxicities, so the pomphigoid type um, uh, rashes or the, God forbid, Stephen Johnson's type of rashes, of course, we will never uh, resume uh, a immune oncology. Uh, rarely, in most cases, skin toxicity does not necessitate the cessation of treatment. 
Um, and of course, we mentioned hypersensitivity reactions, which are general uh, general reaction, not necessarily immune mediated. Then we treat them as as as, as others, so steroids and antihistamines, as as we know. So this is your typical rash on the immune oncology drugs, and this is a patient who actually managed his rash on his own. He would just take he would just uh, elevate his dose of prednisone, and when the rash uh, when the rash went away, he would go back to his 10, uh, 10 uh, milligrams of prednisone, and this is, of course, a much more serious rash that we see, and this, of course, would uh, necessitate a whole uh, systemic uh, therapy and would necessitate cessation of treatment. So really, I'm running really quickly to immune-mediated colitis, and of course, colitis or diarrhea is the most common GI toxicity, uh, and this, this, this diarrhea could, could be accompanied by abdominal pain, fever, anal pain, rectal bleeding, nausea and vomiting. And we should always, of course, search for alternative etiologies. And this is, of course, the, managing, the management. And not necessarily every colitis has to be admitted. If it's, you know, you're grade two colitis and you know you have a good way of, of, of managing your patient, then you don't have to necessarily admit him. But of course, if it's a grade three, you must admit a patient, you must give IV high dose therapy and even consider infliximab anti-TNF antibody if the, uh, if the um, uh, diarrhea does not resolve. And again, we're talking about the slow taper. And just to, to, bold, to, to highlight in bold, the index of suspicion should be high and steroids should be started rapidly. And this is something we really learned, you know, by, by, by experience. I do want to mention there are other immune-mediated GI toxicities such as enteritis, esophagitis, gastritis, ileitis. The whole uh, enteral tract can be involved. This can present with vague symptoms of anorexia, ap upper abdominal discomfort, nausea and vomiting. And again, look, this is a mimicker of our patients. Uh, so we should do an upper endoscopy if we want to establish a diagnosis, but we must start in pre empirical uh, treatment uh, based on the clinics, not based on the, on the, uh, on the endoscopy and a rapid resolution of the system will prove and establish the diagnosis. And, um, and um, I call this clinical entity a big masquerader and we should have it in mind. On the right, you can see a patient of mine who presented with anorexia and uh, food aversion and, and and it was very weird and we didn't really know. And he was starting on steroids. I didn't even, I couldn't even call it by name. And this is his, his, uh, this is his, his upper endoscopy. This is his esophagus, esophagus. He had a very um, significant um, inflammation, which was not can candida or violent inflammation. It was just an immune mediated esophagitis, if you will. And he responded to steroids and his treatment was uh, resumed. His IO treatment was resumed. The lung toxicity, I'm sure you are all familiar with. There are many types of lung toxicities. The most common is the pneumonitis. It's not the only possible uh, lung toxicity. We know that uh, it can, uh, it, um, it manifests as mo mostly as dry, unproductive cough, tachy or dyspnea, cyanosis, fatigue, and fever. But of course, we don't want to get to these points. We want to uh, recognize this at the point of the dry, unproductive cough. And again, it's a clinical diagnosis. We know that it's mainly, uh, you know, you could have a, a normal x-ray, you could have patchy infiltrates, uh, and rarely do we actually do a bronchoscopy and lavage, only in, 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 in cases in which the clinic the clinics are not uh, are not straightforward, and again, the treatment is steroids according uh, to grade. And in severe cases, we do give additional anti-inflammatory drugs such as Celcept or anti-TNF antibodies. So endocrinopathy is another favorite, favorite uh, another uh, famous uh, famous toxicity. These appear in up to 10% of the patients. Of course, the thyroid is the most common organ that is uh, uh, associated with this. We can, we see both hypo we can see hypothyroidism, we see hyperthyroidism, and also acute thyroiditis. And additional rare endocrinopathy would include hypophysitis hypopituitarism and type one uh, diabetes even. So having a 70 year old uh, um, non-small cell lung carcinoma patient appearing with a new onset of uh, type one diabetes as a result of acute uh, immune mediated pancreatitis. 
Um, so I will not go into the clinical, so the clinical presentation of the endocrinopathy is just to say this, that the, the, again, the symptoms can be vague and non-specific, right? So we can see headache and extreme tiredness and weight gain or loss and altered mood and irritability, but this is a, this can be, then this can, can be uh, very similar to the regular symptomatology of our cancer patients. So one must remember these diagnoses. It's very uh, easy to uh, dismiss, uh, to, to miss these things if you don't think about it. And of course, if you're in an adrenal crisis, it will also be characterized by dehydration, hypotonia. The patient will look like a septic patient, but of course it will not be sepsis per se, rather a, a, a picture of, 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 of a septic shock, so to speak. And when, suspicious and when suspicion arises for a, a crisis such as this, we should always take the TSH, the cortisol, and additional tests based on the clinical scenario, such as T3, T4, testosterone, prolactin, et cetera. So I have here a slide about how we monitor thyroid function on immunotherapy. We take TSH every cycle. We have a full battery at baseline and then TSH every cycle. And then, uh, of course, uh, further, further uh, blood tests upon uh, need, and um, and the management is just as the management of the original disease. Uh, acute thyroiditis rarely necessitates treatment. It's an aberrant thyroid. Uh, it's a, it's a scenario of aberrant thyroid function tests without any clear uh, pattern. In it mandates only follow up. Uh, where the acute phase will usually turn out to be hypothyroidism. And of course, I did put it here that uh, if we have the constellation of a low TSH, free T3 and free T4, then this uh, should arise the suspicion for hypopituitarism. So again, I'm really short on time, so I don't have time to go into autoimmune-related hypocortisolism. Uh, again, symptoms would be vague and nonspecific, and we must have a high index of suspicion. The laboratory abnormalities will include low serum cortisol with or without a hyponatremia. And of course, the differential diagnosis would be either a hypophysitis or autoimmune adrenalitis. And we must think of this diagnosis because we must start a treatment as soon as possible with oral prednisolone. I did have a patient about a few weeks ago and coming into clinic very, very tired and fatigued. He had zero cortisol in his blood. So this is truly an emergency or on the verge of emergency. And of course, we taper the dose until eventually we, we replace it with hydrocortisone at 24 to 40 milligrams daily or prednisone 10, whatever your uh, we are uh, regular to be doing. And of course, if it's a hypophysitis, we replace all hormones uh, along all the axes that are, uh, that are uh, hit. So we have here a slide on adrenalitis and hypophysitis. Uh, you, can, uh, you can go over that later. So rare immune-related endocrinopathies, diabetes in CP2 can occur, very, very rare, and we mentioned the type 1 diabetes. So um, there's kidney toxicity, serum A, creatinine elevations, and we should instigate a workup for acute renal failure. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, uh, immune-mediated acute renal failure is a clinical diagnosis by exclusion. And if we see response to pred prednisone, this, then this will have established the diagnosis. The diagnosis. I usually uh, do not admit patients for this. If it's a simple nephritis, then they can get their steroids and just return the following day to clinic to, to do another, um, another uh, creatinine test. Okay, um, so again, steroids should be tapered slowly. My clinical experience is this may even be not as slow as uh, the pneumonitis. And, and again, I do not necessarily stop treatment if one develops nephritis on immune oncology. I do not necessarily stop immune oncology. Moving forward to hepatitis, and again, sorry that this is sort of a, a list of so many toxicities in such a short period of time. So this would, hepatitis would mostly manifest as asymptomatic increase in liver function tests, mainly AST, ALT, and GGT. Uh, it's not rare, it can happen. And of course, we always have to do our differential diagnosis such as progressive disease or other causes of hepatitis. And again, the treatment is steroids. And if there's no resolution, then we need to move forward to uh, other immune uh, suppressants. So just to mention there are musculoskeletal toxicities. We've seen arthritis, we've seen myositis, we've seen a polymyalgia-like syndrome, which is a pain and stiffness of upper and lower extremities without signs of muscle inflammation or muscle weakness. 
And just to mention the immune-mediated myocarditis, infiltration of lymphocytes into the cardiac muscle, this is a medical emergency. This can be fatal, and we have to have a clinical suspicion that it's Okay, so I'm, 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 I'm wrapping up. Uh, these are the neurological toxicities. Again, just so you know that they're out there and we should have them in our minds, auto, autonomic neuropathy, encephalitis, peripheral neuropathy, myasthenia gravis. This is just quickly a list of what are the urgent emergent immune mediated side effects. We discussed the, the toxic epidermal necrolysis, the pneumonitis, myocarditis and myositis, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, hypophysitis can be a medical uh, emergency, adrenal crisis, and encephalitis. So um, practical aspects, one last slide, direct history taken by nurse prior admission to receive IO. We ask about rash, about cough, about shortness of breath and about diarrhea. We take a blood count, liver and kidney function test and TSH. And if abnormal, we consult a physician. And of course, all the wards in, this, in the hospital need to, need to be a uh, part of this. Um, uh, we have to have an extreme accessibility of the medical oncologist to this thing. That's me. That's you. We need to be on, on board because we may get phones like this in the middle of the night. And of course, this is teamwork. We have to advise with our consults, our peers, and our colleagues. This is, again, the take-home message. I don't have time to go over it. I will end with this by John Stein, Steinbeck talking about progress, muscles aching to work, minds aching to create beyond the single need. This is man. For man, unlike any other thing, organic or inorganic in the universe grown be grows beyond his work, walks up the stairs of his concepts, emerges ahead of his accomplishments. So I'm ending. This is my email and you're very, very welcome to ask me questions, to consult about cases, to invite me to Jaipur, all that. So thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Leibowitz. That was such a wonderful and comprehensive, <laughs> comprehensive, com comprehensive talk. We very are quick. Sorry. <laughs> ran through it <laughs> in half the time so really 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 appreciate uh, your uh, time your effort and uh, your being involved and, and accepting to give this talk so really uh, what a pleasure for you to have been here to grace us with your presence i i will ask one quick question in interest of time and then move over to the uh, panel discussion so my question to you is when you are using two drugs ioio how do you decide which one to stop when you see a particular toxicity? Okay, very. so this is a very good question. Of course, first of all, you stop everything until you have a resolution of the, but then, but then, okay, you ask what to resume. So it's a difficult one. It's a clinical decision. Of course, to get colitis on EP Nevo, then it's most probably related to EP and you would stop the EP. What happens if you have pneumonitis? Would you stop the Nevo and then resume the EP? That's a more, a, a tough, a tougher one. So really it's about, you know, clinical decision and consulting, really. We always, we have our, our networks of, of, of peers and consults and we discuss these things all day long. I've instigated what I call an immunotherapy forum, which, which uh, includes on, all consultants relevant to, to these cases so that we're all on board this, this thing. It's, you have it's a not... name for the forum, I, I remember. Yes. Yes. You have the mascots uh, for the immunotherapy forum. So thank you again. Thanks for gracing us. Thank you. We'll, 